this work? Yeah, it does work. This is oh, this. I, I, Mark has a cold, and as a result, I wasn't sure that this was working. Ah, yeah. yeah but now I see it. I see it is working. It is working. And uh, actually, your reference to the idea that uh, we can, or the you, you quoted, was it your grandmother you quoted who said that we can rest in our coffin? That was my great aunt. I can that was your great aunt. Her picture astride on the horse about to meet with General Papa. Well, bring it. I mean, not now, perhaps, but I mean, we, 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 we do want to see it. Um, it reminds me of uh, what the French say. Uh, we, you know, to the, this regard, uh, for those of you who speak French, uh, je suis né fatigué. I was born tired. <laughs> anyway, I'm very glad to be here. I'm a longtime friend of the Institute of World Politics and of Marek as well. And uh, uh, the, the, the title of my talk is Russia at War with the U.S., which actually was thought up by me. Uh, when I was asked for a su suggested name of my presentation, uh, is very current right now because uh, Morgan Freeman, the actor, and a, a group of other people have, have announced publicly that we need to consider, we need to understand that Russia is the enemy. And we need not to be under any illusions about that. Now, I'm not sure how Morgan Freeman has arrived at this conclusion. They hacked him. They hacked him. Oh, they hacked him, but they hacked me too. <laughs> and uh, I'm not sure that I would put it quite the same way. Uh, I think that uh, Ru the, the, the Russian regime is antagonistic, certainly, to the United States. There's no question about that. And part, you know, part of the way in which they express this is by hacking into uh, the email of people like me, then publishing the emails after they've been changed uh, to give a, a completely false impression. But you have to draw a, con a, a distinction when we talk about Russia between the Russian regime and the Russian people in society. Uh, in many respects, the, the entity that we should be concerned about is the, is the Russian regime. And when we talk about enemies, uh, we should be very careful. Uh, today's enemy can be tomorrow's friend. And in any case, the enemy of the Russian regime is not the United States, and it's not the United States that the regime fears most of all. It's the Russian people. This is a regime that is afraid of its own people, that is ready to kill ordinary uh, citizens as well as oppositionists, uh, that understands that its interests are contrary to the interests of the people, and that treats Russia like an occupying power. In some ways, they're even worse than some occupiers. Some occupiers. So the real question, I think, for us is, how did Russia get to be a, a country in which the government is basically the enemy of the people? And what are the implications of that? How did this happen after the fall of communism, when there was so much hope? It, People now tend to forget the, the level of enthusiasm that accompanied the fall of communism and the birth of so-called democratic Russia. No, no one, no foreign leader in any case, was a hero in the U.S. Uh, to the degree that Yeltsin was in 1991-1992. Gorbachev before him was also a hero. But he lost some of that aureole, and it was transferred to Yeltsin. The country that has emerged 25 years later as an aggressor state and an oppressor of its own people was very far from evident in 1991-1992 when the Soviet Union fell. The dominant opinion in the United States was that Russia was going to become a strategic ally of the United States. That uh, the future of Russia 
uh, would be what in fact has been realized in the case of Poland. After all, Poland was also a communist country. But today, Poland is a relatively successful, I mean, whatever problems it has are relative, uh, a relatively successful democracy and a firm ally of the United States. That was not only hoped for in 1992, 1991, it was expected. And it, it, it was a, a reflection of the superficiality and dilettantism of American foreign policy. That we concentrated all of our efforts on promoting whatever political agenda was advanced by Yeltsin forgetting that there was an entire country that we had to be concerned about. And that contrary to our simplistic thinking, uh, the interests of Yeltsin were not automatically identical with the interests of the country or the interests of democracy. The important thing that happened in Russia after the fall of the Soviet Union was the failure to really break with the Soviet inheritance may seem strange now, but in fact, uh, Marxist-Leninist ideology, communist ideology, left a very considerable imprint on the psychology of the country. One of the most fundamental principles of Marxism is that economic factors are the base of society. Cultural, religious, uh, intellectual factors are the superstructure. Everything that occurs in the superstructure is ultimately determined by the base. So if you change the economic relations in society, for example, if you change the property relations from a system in which the state monopolizes property and create a system in which all property is in private hands, then the superstructure will change automatically. All of this suggested that all the only thing that was necessary in Russia was an economic transformation. It didn't matter that the, that the moral legacy of communism was left untouched, that there was no rule of law, that there was no appreciation for the, for the importance of the individual. All of the things which underpin democracy and uh, a functioning and equitable free market capitalist system in the West those things were not uh, considered. The important thing was to put property in private hands and to do it as quickly as possible. Remember that everything in the Soviet Union was in the hands of the state. Uh, this was, the, according to, to, to communist ideology, this meant that it was in the hands of all the people. In fact, it was in the hands of a repressive bureaucracy. After the Soviet Union fell, <clears throat> the so-called young reformers who considered themselves radical free market liberals, but in fact were persons under the sway of communist ideology, presumed that the only thing that needed to happen was for private property to be uh, dispensed uh, and uh, parceled out as quickly as possible. And that is exactly what happened. They assumed that by doing that they would create a class of private owners who would prevent a communist revenge because they would have an economic interest. And in the process, it didn't matter who got the property. If it, it didn't matter in who it, it, if it was handed out to criminals, uh, if it was handed out to those who were corrupt. And in a country which had suffered for generations from a kind of hunger and famine uh, for material goods, Suddenly, the opportunity was created to steal with complete impunity. The government wasn't concerned about whether the property was stolen. It was concerned that it be turned over to private individuals. So, as a result, a, an intensive process of negative competition was, was launched in Russia, which had the result that anyone who had any kind of moral principles anyone who was in any way ethical, immediately sank to the bottom. And the most unprincipled, the most ruthless, the most criminal, 
they came out on top. Uh, the country was driven into grinding poverty. The, na the gross national product of Russia uh, fell by more than half. Uh, the industrial production in Russia fell by more than half. That didn't happen even under Nazi occupation. The, um, <clears throat> the response of the new capitalists was not to develop production, but rather to strip assets. As a result, fundamental shortages developed in the country that could not be remedied. And the, 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 it, the, the workers in, in Russia went months without being paid their salaries. Uh, because there was there was nothing to there was nothing to pay them with, all of the assets of the of the of the factories and enterprises that had been taken over uh, had been looted. Uh, millions of people survived in Russia only because they were able to raise their own food. Uh, they went out every weekend to the countryside, and those who had dacha plots uh, planted vegetables. And as a, as a result, we're able to survive. Uh, under these conditions, there was a demographic catastrophe in Russia. The population of Russia uh, fell to, to by uh, 750,000 a year during the 1990s. Now, demographers have a a term, it's called surplus deaths. Uh, it's, it's a terrible term, but that's the term they use. It means that mortality that exceeds the level that could have been predicted on the basis of pre-existing trends. So in other words, a demographer looks at the situation in a country at a certain point of time and projects the, the existing trends into the future. This is by the way, standard sociological practice, and makes a prediction of what the population of that country will be, say, five years hence. If, in fact, the, uh, and this, of course, is, is, is arrived at by calculating both the death rate and the birth rate, but if the death rate uh, exceeds the projections, and if the birth rate falls below the project, pro projections, uh, then the, 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 predic the prediction as a whole uh, proves to be false. Uh, so you have either, uh, you can have surplus births, uh, surplus, surplus natality, or surplus mortality uh, in the case that the projections are incorrect. In Russia, the figure for the surplus mortality was 6 million. That's in the 1990s. That's why Russians sometimes refer to the 1990s as the Golodomor, because uh, the, the, the scale of the death uh, from all causes was simply phenomenal. People simply gave up on their own lives. Uh, suicides reached record levels. Murder reached record levels. The number of people who disappeared without a trace accidents, uh, not to mention an incredible increase in uh, cardiovascular disease and deaths and oncological disease. Trends that simply uh, were n had not been seen by Western demographers in a society that was at peace. R Russia began to exhibit the death rate of a country at war. <laughs> I can tell you a, a, a story. I was out in Vladivostok because I wrote for my second book, which uh, was called Darkness at Dawn, The Rise of the Russian Criminal State. And uh, I was there in, in the wintertime, and there were a lot of people out on the ice uh, fishing. And every, every couple of days the ice would break and people would drown. <laughs> 
When I was there, the, the, the police were out in boats chasing people off the ice and telling them that it was dangerous to be, to be here and, and you can't be here. And people, generally speaking, got up and left, but there was one old man who refused. Finally, they, they, they brought the boats to the place where he was fishing and demanded that he get up and leave. And after a great deal of resistance, he, he did get up and he left. And afterwards, uh, we asked him, is it, why did you stay out there on the ice? You know that it could break at any minute and you would drown in the, in the bay. And he said, I'd rather die than live the way I'm living now. Uh, there was a, uh, an article in Moscow Times, an interview with a grave digger in one of the Moscow seminar, uh, cemeteries, where there was an entirely new plot that had been opened. And he told the, the reporter, he said, you see these graves? It pointed to a whole row, rows and rows of fresh graves. He says, it's all young people, working people. We never had that before. Uh, the male life expectancy fell by six years to 57. Lowest, rate, lowest life expectancy in the industrial world. Well, under these circumstances, you can well imagine that, that Yeltsin could not, who, who engineered this whole process, who, who was behind the desperate effort to transfer assets without any regard to the, to the nature of the recipients, would not be a popular figure in Russia. 1998. Uh, polls began to show that Yeltsin's popularity was 2%. Now, in any, if, if any of you are sociologists, you know that in any public opinion poll, 6% of the respondents do not understand the question. So it's doubtful whether anyone in Russia supported Yeltsin. In the summer of 1999, a poll was taken after the previously unknown head of the, K, of the FSB, formerly KGB, now FSB, uh, Vladimir Putin, was named Yeltsin's prime minister. And for some reason, Yeltsin announced that he wanted Putin to be his successor, apparently forgetting that the successor had to be chosen in a democratic election. His popularity rating was also 2%. But that summer of 1999, when I was in Moscow, was a very, uh, there was an atmosphere of menace uh, in Moscow. Everyone expected that something was going to happen. The Yeltsin would not simply hand over power. Uh, there were various rumors, but most people thought there was going to be some type of provocation. And it would be used in order to declare martial law and cancel the elections. Uh, one version of this was that there was going to be a war between criminal gangs in the center of Moscow that would then be uh, used as an excuse to declare martial law. Another version was that prominent celebrities, maybe TV personalities, would be taken hostage and then murdered. Uh, in a way that would shock public opinion and justify, once again, uh, uh, the suspension of democratic rights and, and the imposition of, of martial law. And then another version was that uh, government buildings would be blown up. It goes without saying that no one, not I, not anyone else, had any idea what was going to happen. But there was this atmosphere of menace and then suddenly apartment buildings began to be blown up in the middle of the night. First in Buinovsk, which was in Dagestan, and then two in Moscow, then one in Volgodonsk. And Putin, uh, who had, no one really knew at the time, who had no personality at all, he had never run for office. His only background was as a, uh, uh, an agent of the KGB and then the FSB suddenly was everywhere saying that we're going to destroy the terrorists wherever we find them. If necessary, we'll, if they're in the outhouse, we'll destroy them in the outhouse. He used criminal slang, machi, which means liquidate. 
uh, about 25% of the population of Russia has been through the prisons. So they're very familiar with prison slang. But it was in a way a way to show determination, and it resonated because the population believed that Chechen terrorists who were blamed for the bombings had attacked innocent Russian people, murdering entire families while they slept, and that Russia had to be defended. Uh, on the basis of that instinct, uh, Putin was able to uh, organize a new invasion of Chechnya, which eventually cost tens of thousands of additional lives. Uh, his popularity soared, and there was no need for martial law. Putin was elected the, ne the, the next president of Russia. His first official act was to announce that the results of the dishonest privatization of the 1990s would not be reconsidered, which of course had been on the agenda of the, of the, of the political candidates uh, who were considering running in the 2000 elections uh, against him, and uh, those that uh, in the end did run against him. And he said, and he added that uh, uh, Yeltsin would be pardoned for all crimes committed uh, while he was in office. The fact that Yeltsin felt he needed that kind of blanket guarantee is itself eloqu eloquent testimony to what went on in Russia in the 1990s. And everything would have been successful had it not been for the fact that a fifth bomb uh, was discovered in the basement of a building in Ryazan, uh, and it was deactivated. And the persons who, who planted the bomb turned out to be not uh, Chechen terrorists, but uh, members of the FSB. Well, you would have thought in any normal society that that information would have convulsed public opinion. But, in the, but Russia's, Russian civil society is very weak uh, and undeveloped. And Western powers were very quick to believe a whole series of crazy explanations of why it was these F FSB agents were putting a bomb in a building that turned out to be identical to the bombs that blew up four other buildings and killed 300 people. And there was a war on and an election underway and, it, and the, the, the Russian people suitably distracted did not take the opportunity to demand an explanation. And those who in later years did demand an explanation, one by one, were murdered. Yuri, all of them, my friends, Yuri Shekhachikhin, Sergei Yushchenkov, Anna Palatkovskaya, Alexander Litvinenko, all and others who, 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 who tried to get to the truth about what happened in Ryazan, one by one met, met a violent death. Our people <coughs> here in the U.S. did everything possible to avoid uh, raising the subject of the Ryazan Institute incident. I recently filed requests with the State Department, FBI, CIA, Freedom of Information requests for documents about what our government knew about, these, about the, the terrorist acts of 1999. And it's clear to me from even the limited number of documents that I received that our government, our State Department, was not willing to examine the evidence objectively, but was instinctively serving as defense attorneys for the Russian government, finding explanations for their behavior that even the Russians didn't advance. As a result, Putin was never held accountable, nor were those in the Yeltsin entourage who were responsible for setting this up, because Putin, in fact, was not in power. He went along with it, but it was our hero Yeltsin and his entourage that ultimately were responsible for the bombings themselves. So what happened next in Russia was perfectly predictable. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the KGB was called in to protect the, the, the assets that were stolen by Yeltsin's corrupt cronies. And then they began to outdo the Yeltsin entourage in terms of corruption and violence. 
And faced with the democratic, with, with, with continuing violations of human rights, and the very, very mild attempts of people in the West to object to them, uh, Putin became more and more aggressive toward the West. Well, people ask, how do we counter Russian propaganda, which is one of the manifestations of this hostility? Uh, what do we do about it that Russia is uh, no longer a friend of the U.S. if it ever was one? And uh, these questions are extremely naive and inexperienced because it ne never seems to occur to anyone that we don't have to answer Russian propaganda. We have to be insist on the truth about the history that has already taken place. That's what we need to do, and not anything else. But in the failure uh, to do that, we of course create an open field for Russians to undermine the U.S., both psychologically, politically, ideologically. And that is what they're do, trying to do. They do a very bad job of it. Uh, and in fact, their results are, are decidedly mixed. Despite all the anger over RT and Sputnik, the Russian uh, information agencies, they really don't have much of an audience. They remind me of latter-day versions of the Soviet radio peace and progress. Um, just as a diversion, I once knew when I was in this work, writing from the Soviet Union, I knew a woman who worked in the letters department of radio peace and progress. And she shared with me some of the schizophrenic letters that people would write to Radio Peace and Progress uh, to praise the station. She got one letter from some guy in Mexico who said, I, I want you to know that I've been listening to nothing but Radio Peace and Progress since the Spanish Civil War. <laughs> and, I, and I consider it the only objective source of information in the world. <laughs> and he said, and by the way, for $250,000, I'm ready to kill the president of Mexico. So, uh, but, but this, this type of audience, which has been inherited by RT and Sputnik, and of course, they, it's been expanded a bit, because they, there are a lot of discontented people in the U.S. who don't really care about the source of their information. They just want something that they think you can use against a, as a club against those they don't like. Uh, but still, it's not going. It's not going to be decisive. What what made a big change was the fact that Russian disinformation efforts uh, began to focus on the election. Now, the pur the Russian purpose in all this was to create chaos in the U.S. But it was not, as so many people have, have tried to argue, uh, in order to defeat Hillary Clinton. Uh, Russians had no reason to be concerned about Hillary Clinton. She was one of those who was behind the reset policy. Throughout her term, her one term as Secretary of State, she, she showed a purely bureaucratic mentality and an absolute lack of understanding of any of the intellectual and ideological forces that under, underpin Russia's relationship with the U.S. and with the rest of the world. But, but uh, from the point of view of American politics, uh, the, 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 the Russians, by targeting Hillary as well as Trump, because they also created the Trump dossier, which I consider to be 100% phony, uh, were, were mounting an attack against uh, the practically sacred effort to have a woman as commander-in-chief of the American Armed Forces. And uh, Russians understanding the emotions involved in this country were able to play on them. And that's why we have the, the, the chaos that we have now, politically, and not because they are particularly effective or what they do is particularly convincing. Um, 
It is, in fact, the reaction of a regime which is ultimately very weak. Uh, it's very weak because it can only maintain its hold on power through manipulation, uh, through corruption, and propaganda. And those are very unreliable pillars of a political system in the long run. And the existence of free societies in the West, including an election in the U.S., in which, to the amazement of Russians, the outcome was not known until the very end, uh, is a, an implicit and, in some cases, explicit threat to that system. And that, therefore, it has to have, there has to be some type of aggressive response. Uh, the, what magnifies and magnified that response is the fact that people in the U.S. don't care about Russia. They care about how uh, any evidence of Russian interference, which was marginally effective uh, in terms of changing the outcome of the, the uh, election, but maximally effective in creating pol political conflict in the U.S. today, uh, can be used. So, but, but even this aggressive posture toward the U.S. is only a reflection of the extent to which the regime is an enemy of its own people. After all, this is not just killing opposition leaders. In 1999, the, the Yeltsin entourage and Putin, with Putin's cooperation was willing to murder hundreds of randomly chosen, completely innocent people who had nothing to do with politics. A pure act of terror. Uh, a regime of that kind cannot uh, uh, rely ultimately on the long on its own long-term stability, and this is all in the final analysis is what makes it dangerous, uh, because it's an enemy of its own people, uh, and because Russia it has more nuclear weapons than any other country. There's the possibility in the short run and the long run that what we will face is instability in Russia, which is potentially dangerous not just to Russians. It's dangerous to them in the first, first order, but it's dangerous to the whole world. So in light of all this, <coughs> what I think is extremely important and what I've tried to explain in the books that I've written, some of which I know Mark has read. <laughs> Actually, all of them. All of them? I'll tell you later. All right, I hope so. <coughs> And uh, that, that what, the, the role of the West has to be uh, to, to defend those principles in Russia that people there actually are ready to accept if they understand them. Uh, and uh, and the only way to do this is to be honest about what's happened in, in Russia and to be intelligent in interpreting it. I don't think this is beyond the ability of the U.S., uh, but it is really the great challenge in U.S.-Russian relations. And in that respect, uh, the U.S. can prove itself to be not an enemy of Russia, but in the final analysis, analysis its truest friend. Now, Mark, have I talked too long? No. No? Well, do we want to ask for questions? Let me why don't we? Why don't we do that? Okay. Or why don't you? Ladies and gentlemen. Mark, is this water for drinking or is this just it's for you. decorative? I haven't this is <laughs> that is decorative. This is the decorative part. Yeah. Because so. After all this talking, one. Alright. Yes. Bolsheviks have been known to drink that, but you're not one of them. They murdered almost all the cultural people, culture, cultured people. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I highly recommend all of David's books, which all but one are assigned in my um, class on Russia, in addition to a couple others that I assign. All of them, except for one. One that I have not assigned to my class for Russia is his latest, The Less You Know, The Better You Sleep. Uh, why? Because I assigned it in my seminar on history of conspiracy theory in practice. 
Usually, outside of IWP, civilians smirk that there is such a thing as a conspiracy. I'm sorry. Uh, there were eight insane people who met in Paris and quarreled over the leadership of Iskra. They called themselves Bolsheviks. They promised to collectivize private property, women, and various other things. Not that they fulfilled all their promises, but they tried. And millions died. So conspiracies do exist. And David David's is one of the most superb, accessible books by a journalist. Of course, I also assign primarily things like Umberto Eco, Foucault's Pendulum, Joseph Conrad, Secret Agent, and Chester Town Man. That was Thursday because you have to have the sword of imagination to be ready for David. Without poetry, you can't hack it. Of course, I have a, a couple of monographs on uh, conspiracy, conspiracy theories in the 17th century, which are tedious, but students don't find them offensive. And the mechanisms have not changed. So conspiracies do exist. We, don't be, we do not believe in conspiracy theories, but we watch very carefully people who do. And so does David. Now I will. I think David has agreed to a couple of questions. Anybody? Yes, Mrs. Forrest. Oh, or should, should I, 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 I come? Yes. Here? Oh, I'll stay. All right. Here. We can go. <coughs> That's all. Yes, please. I like to look at you know, whoever asks me questions. Hi. Um, you mentioned in your speech that um, the Russians understand the emotions of the U.S. people. And this is, I mean, I, I wrote it down, I quoted it. And yeah. So, um, I'm asking you if this was, um, if this was an investigated statement of yours that you can, you know, verify, or what is your opinion of, or your belief of the Russians' understanding of the U.S. emotions? What are our emotions that they are understanding? Well, I, I, what I, what I wanted to say is the regime is uh, perfectly capable of seeing the hostility in the U.S. Uh, and the, the, con the conflicts over all, all of the internal issues that have become extremely venomous. You know, after the, the, the Cold War came to an end, the, um, We lost, I mean, Gorbachev at one point said to some who was an American visitor, we're going to deprive, we're going to do the worst thing possible. We're going to deprive you of, of an enemy. To a certain extent, he was correct. When the Cold War came to an end, we no longer uh, were inclined to, as a society, to think about broader international issues. The question of communism versus capitalism, you know, freedom versus dictatorship and totalitarianism. Uh, the worldwide conflict between the superpowers and what it meant, which was a historic conflict, all of that disappeared from our consciousness, and we began to focus on very, very narrow and, and, and parochial issues. You know, you know, safe spaces in universities where you don't have to discuss things. Uh, well, you know the list as well as anyone else. Now, it isn't that, that those issues aren't worth talking about. They certainly are, I suppose. But there's no awareness of their relative insignificance. Uh, we take those issues now, in the absence of the Cold War and the super war, superpower conflict, as global issues, that are titanic issues that, that are, are worth fighting, fighting, fighting fiercely over. Uh, and it's just that mis misconception that makes us vulnerable to manipulation by outside powers who can make... Uh, the partisan of, partisans of one point of view or another, or one candidate or another, imagine that, that countries which are opposed to the United States as a whole are actually closer to them than their internal antagonists. Uh, and that's why you saw on both sides a readiness to use the Russians for their own purpose, to, to get Russian help. In the case of the Trump campaign, it was only expressed verbally, as far as I can see. 
and no concrete steps were taken. In the case of the Clinton campaign, money was paid in order to get this phony dossier, which anyone with any experience of the KGB or FSB would read and see immediately it was, not, it was a fake. So that's what I mean. Remember, a person with a defect will always understand a normal person. But a person with a, who has a normal mentality will have a very hard time understanding the mental world of someone who's de who has a defect. And that's, that's, that's the story of, of, of the ability of, of Russians to help us, help ourselves, uh, to create chaos. Yeah, okay. please. And this gentleman yes. in the back. Uh, thank you very much, sir. My name is Connor Clark. I uh, learned a lot and I, uh, that I want to start Googling later, so thank you very much. <laughs> All right. As, as a uh, inspiring. Hit the library. His books are in our library. Excellent. Even better. <laughs> um, so I hope I don't sound like I'm pushing back too much on this, but it sounds like um, you, well, you said that the primary goal of the Russian operatives in the election was to create chaos and not to sway the election. While totally agreeing that they wanted chaos, they wanted to cast doubt on their legitimacy, and I feel like they may have followed through with that more, even, had Clinton won, they would have spouted things, oh, it's, you know, rigged in the front, you know, they, um, but it, it does really seem, from what we've seen, that um, whether it's President Trump's financial assets, his um, ideological bent towards authoritarianism and away from international law that are frankly the bases of most of the sanctions we have with their human rights issues and, and uh, foreign adventurism, uh, and in some ways basic um, bureaucratic confidence compared to Hillary Clinton, there seems to be an awful lot of interest that Russia would have in swaying the election. Um, so what led you to the conclusion that swaying the election was considered either unachievable or not in Russia's interests vis-a-vis uh, just creating chaos? Okay, that's a very good question. I think that the, um, there are a couple of reasons why this is... You know, Russian intelligence operations are meticulously planned uh, and coordinated well in advance. The there, there's the <clears throat> the principal incident that's been mentioned, uh, in which the Russians supposedly were working with the Trump campaign, in order to undermine Hillary Clinton, uh, involved information that was conveyed by email from a music promoter. Well, a part-time music promoter with who had uh, only who lived in London and had very tangential ties to, to people in the Russian uh, uh, Russian uh, d defense ministries and elsewhere, uh, it's not consistent with the way in which I've seen Russian intelligence operate over many years. It's consistent with a disinformation campaign. That's one thing. The other thing is, bear this in mind about uh, Trump, when he became, uh, the way I read Trump, is that when he ran for president, he was concentrated on rallying discontented people in the U.S. and then expanding on that base. Uh, he said a whole series of imbecilic things. There's no question about it. And his choice of advisors uh, uh, was was you know I'm you know I thought you you couldn't get any more stupid than the people that we have had up until now. But uh, Trump really outdid himself with uh, uh, some of the people that he named. You know, one of his top advisors being someone who had worked with Gazprom, the most corrupt com corporation in the world. And um, I, <laughs> there was a congressman here who had a close relationship with uh, uh, Gas Gazprom, and then he was indicted. At this at this point, I was teaching at Johns Hopkins. Uh, I was, or no, actually, I was teaching at the University of Illinois. But uh, I told my students that we should collect some money to give him a going to prison present because I understood that, you know, for example, checkers or something like that because he'd have a lot of spare time when he got to prison. But the, you know, to, to take people from this pool and make them your advisors on Russia, you have to really be ignorant. 
But to Trump's, uh, but 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 he he got the idea in his head that well we'll make friends with Russia and we won't we will will eliminate it, which is a a fallacy that's common to practically every candidate. He carried it a lot further. But you know he was always going to repu- rely on the on the Repu- Republican Congress and on re- traditional Republican attitudes toward national defense. And my view of it was that his this, the kind of lack of good judgment and ignorance in time would be dissipated. Uh, and this is exactly what happened. And that was th- that this was campaign rhetoric. So for all these, and I think that the Russians came to exactly the same conclusion. For that reason, to, to take the risk of ma- a major intelligence operation intended, intended to change the outcome of the, op- of the election, and only a major operation could have done that, uh, was just not in their interest. It was better, just, and better and much easier just to sow chaos so that whoever won would be crippled.